that it bounces all over the place. So I've published on a lot of strange topics. And um, this is an example of a strange topic. I, I'm not, I'm a geographer. I don't know much about the Middle Ages. People in this room know more in that little finger than I know about the Ren Renaissance or the Middle Ages. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it does fit, it does fit. Throughout the 1800s, and even before, there was not much work done on games. We don't know a lot about the games that were played in the past. Uh, a lot of examples of that. Brian Sutton Smith, I'll mention his name several times, was in many respects a major scholar in the study of games. And he blamed it on the triviality barrier. It's trivial. Why bother with that? Don't do it. Uh, no one cares. A lot of games are just lost. Uh, for example, marble games. I did a major paper on marbles. And what were the marble games in the past? We don't know. In the Revolutionary War and Civil War, adult men would play marbles. But we don't know what game it was. There's still apparently some men down in the Belize, adults, playing marbles who can be very active. They sit up to 20 feet. Now, that better be flat ground. Any little blurb, a little stick would send a marble off. Uh, we know about that game because some an anthropologist wrote about it. But a lot of the games of the past we don't know. Now, I'll talk about that maybe a little bit later on. As late as 1920, the philosophy, in a book on philosophy of play, someone wrote, what is play? That which people do when they have food, shelter, clothing, and rested and free from worry. When the physical compulsions of life are removed temporarily, and the spirit is free to search for its own satisfaction. In other words, it's, okay, triviality. Uh, things, things began to change eventually. Um, but in this early days, the games were divorced from reality. And that, that's sort of true for young children. Say, a three-year-old, two-year-old, they start playing. Uh, but when they get a little older, they start imitating life. And that's important, imitating life. I'd get upset with my grandchildren because they come over to visit, they're on the computer all the time. That's preparation for life. At 12 years old, they're better than me. On a computer. So I shouldn't be fussing at them. These games are preparation for life. And that's what these games are that I'll be talking about here. So attitudes began to change. The first person to do serious work on uh, games in England was a, a woman named Alice Gome, G O M M E. Uh, and she recorded many games. Unfortunately, the library doesn't have it. Not doing my work, I had to get it the library alone to get the book. Uh, but then others began doing work. So before you could do real scholarly work, you had to record the games and where are they, where they play, what the names used, and how are they played, and so on. Uh, so this, I did die hard. Uh, Brian Sutton Smith was the real anchor for much of the study of, of games. Uh, as late as 71, uh, he said, play is segregated and not very important activity. But at the time, he realized there was tension was going on. Times were changing, and he did change. And he did a lot of very scholarly work later on. Uh, his, this book was very good. He realized this. He said, this book is a record of older attitudes. So he knew that you, you ideas were coming along. Uh, beginning in the 19th, oh, it was a really good book uh, in 1969. It was. Uh, a husband and wife team, anthropologists and folklorists. Children's game in street and playground, where they recorded as many games as they could find in the British Isles. All the British Isles. And I'll be talking about it, this book a little bit, because uh, they do mention these games I'll be talking about. Uh, where is my pointer? In my pocket. Uh, but beginning in the 50s and 70s, there was serious work done on games. Uh, I'll look at two specific games here. Let me get the lights a little darker. Uh, you can see the games. I'll be, uh, this is this is Kinderspiel, done by Bruegel in 1660. Uh, but you can see that uh, the two games I'll be talking about are here and here. But it's hard to tell what how many games are being played, and, and so on. And what's the difference between play, games, and sport? 
because uh, some of this is not games, uh, like climbing a tree. Is that a game, or is it play, or is it just a sport, or swimming? Oh, here, uh, someone got bladders, a uh, big bladders probably, swimming, and a little nude boy out here. And, and what is a game? Uh, a lot of, lot of ideas as to what, what are the games. I'll talk about that in a minute. And two, I'll talk about this one right here. This one, and this one right there. This one, God knows what it is. Uh, in English, I've got an English one that says it's uh, beating the baby. In, in German and Dutch, the best I could get out and translating it, loosely translated, was uh, uh, raising, the, raising and whipping or something like that. You know? uh, I never played that one. But I look at those two specific games. It started when a editor of the journal, of Louisiana History, asked me to do an art, a paper on games. And you play that you, you had. And he said, be sure to use as many French words as you can. At the time, they were writing the dictionary. And they wanted to pick up more game names and words, French words that children used in an earlier time. And so um, I said, OK, I can do that. It's easy. And I started with a shotgun approach, all the games. Well, that's impossible. You can't get anything in depth that way. And, and toys, like something like this. Uh, fork stick with a rubber. Rubber on. That doesn't go far back because it has rubber on it, you see. But uh, a lot of games do go far back. And I decided that's not very good. I'll do a concentrate on two games. And so I did. Uh, the. Uh, this is Broigo. Now, it, it, it's when? It probably says. 1570, uh, which means he died in 15. Ooh, I'm going to hear something. 1569. So it, it could be a contemporary type picture. This is Bruegel again. A little bit about Bruegel. We'll start talking about the author first. He died in 16. 1569, we don't know when he was born, 1525, which makes him a young man, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, maybe, at the, at the most 46 when he died. So to me, that's the prime of life. Uh, this is a self-portrait by Broglie. And you can see he's got, he's the artist, that far away look in his eye, the pink book, the pink brush in his hand, and then behind him, we have the, uh, the merchant. Kind of doofus looking, you know? Kind of staring. And he's got his hand in his pocket, reaching for the money. Because Bruegel made his money selling paintings. And uh, I don't, he never sold this one, of course. No one would say, I bought this. And that's me. Uh, but that's, that's Bruegel. He's often called Bruegel the peasant. Uh, because he would go out into the streets dressed as a peasant. He was a city slicker of a small town, but he'd go out into the, into the, into the small, tiny towns and in the rural area and sketching and taking notes and so on and so forth. Uh, he was born between the Netherlands and Belgium. So he was Walloon speaking, Germanic speaking. And uh, he did some work in Italy. It had an impact on him here. A lot of his paintings were on the Dutch landscape and then the Alps in the background. Artistic license. You, you can do that. Uh, so he was a, called Bruegel the Peasant. When it comes to genealogy of his family, here's a genealogy. This is Peter Bruegel the Elder. Two sons. But he was apprenticed to Peter Koch. Van Als, he's from the town he was from who was married to Macon, Fairholtz, and uh, he married the daughter of his advisor, his mentor. And so when, he, when Bruegel dies young, these two boys are taught by the grandmother and the mother, named Maria or Macon, uh, taught by the mother. You can see he had Peter Bruegel the Younger was a good painter, but he was not outstanding in the sense that he copied his daddy's work. 
There'll be, he did several paintings of Big Kinderspiel. And there it is, his copy. Uh, Jan Bruegel, the elder, was much more accomplished and much more recognized. And he had three, two sons who, who did well. Ambrosius Bruegel and Jan Bruegel the younger. And two daughters who married into painting families. They were related to all the Tenier family. And they were big painting family in the Netherlands. And Bashiet in Haruana, Hieronymus von Hessel, that comes from the word uh, Jerome. It's Latinized, Jeromanus sometimes, Hieronymus. And they had one son who was a very good elder, a painter. And Jan Bruegel, the younger, had Peter Bruegel. Adam was the best, Abraham was the best. And then there was John, Jan Bach. To me, I, I'm no judge of painting. But people say, oh, that one's much better. Maybe so, I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not a painter. Now, moving on to the kings, this is young Bruegel the Elder, his wife and two of their children. They had several more. When you come to the games, you can say, what's well, strange is that there's several games missing here. There's no board games. Certainly they were playing chess. There must have been some board games, but they're not there. And other games. I wrote an article on a game we played called Steal the Flag. It was brought to America by the, the uh, Christian brothers, the French Christian brothers, the De La Salle brothers. And I, I was doing work on that. And then I talked to one person, and I found out that the, the uh, Brothers of Sacred Heart from France also brought the name, the game to America. And I was at a uh, luncheon somewhere, and I'm talking to someone, he uh, mentioned that. Oh, he said, my brother is the runs the, the uh, Brothers of the Sacred Heart in Rome. I'll give me his name. And it really opened up a lot, because then I could write to people. He gave me lots of names of older people. And that game, Steal the Flag, I'm positive, goes back to Prisoner's Base. It, it's a game played in, in, it was described as the most popular game in Europe in the Middle Ages. But no one's exactly sure exactly what it was. We can make guesses and pretty close. And the game that we played was a takeoff on that, a much lower level, you might say, easier to play. Um, we left out the bases, the sanctuary type things. But there's a lot of games missing from here when you start looking at it and say, why, why did they do this? Why did they do that? Why not uh, barley break? Barley break was very popular in the late, in, in the Renaissance. It's not in there. Again, barley break maybe because it requires uh, certainly prisoners bait because it's like a football field, but a lot of people on either side. And maybe that's more room for that. You notice this is kind of a bird's eye view with a lot of things going on. When he gets older, it's more at eye level and the, the individuals are much larger. He, he changes with time. It does change with time. So, but many of the games you see there are still played today. I certainly, uh, riding a hobby horse. We did that. Uh, rolling these round things. And we, my grandfather had a, a forge. It hadn't been used in 30 years. But as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, I had a cousin a year younger than, uh, a month younger than me. And we'd go on that forge and we'd make knives and uh, the anthracite coal around. Uh, how we knew to do this and how to temper it, I don't know, but we did. Uh, so we, we did that. Uh, walking on stilts. We had stilts, just two sticks that we you know, and walk on him. Now this, this guy on stilts over here, looks like his mother yelling at him, get off of there or something. I know that's what my mother would say. I mean, that's extreme. That is extreme. Uh, not even leapfrog, although we would put our derrieres to the runners coming on. But they're, they're playing leapfrog. There's something you can <coughs> recognize. Here they're playing tops. We play tops all the time. We play games with tops. When we play tops, you put this, the point up and you throw it. And I went to my side yard about two weeks ago. I couldn't make the darn thing spin. But I know that's how we did it. Point it out. And that game was a big circle and we played toss. Here they're using a different kind of game, though. You see they've got a different kind of top. They've got whips, a stick with a whip. You want to see that go to the Renaissance Fair. They're usually somebody and two people around whipping top tops with those whips. We didn't do that. Uh, but several games we, we used to play that recognize in there. Some you don't. Some is simply, what's the difference between a game and play? To me, a, 
A game is when there's little competition. So if there's a race going on, it's a game. Otherwise, it's just play. Uh, that's a game, because there's competition in this. This is described as a wedding procession. It's all girls, and little girls in front kind of throwing petals. Uh, that's play. And this one is a, uh, described as a baptismal procession. The first baby person is carrying a baby. Um, now, how many games are played in that depends on who's counting and what kind of imagination that person has. So one person has got identified 58. Most people identify about 80, 81, 84, and one is 91. Now, the, the, they're all, the, 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 this is an example. There's a uh, Life magazine in 1950 has, you can take a look at this later, has the games. And on the back of one of the sheets, it's got what they claim the games are. And they find 71. But they're not considered the experts. You know, this is. But there was one scholar who did a study of all the games. And how many can these three main scholars identify? Hinman. Uh, Sandra Hinman. In uh, Bart Bolton in 1981, September. And of the three, one defined this found 91. But that person kind of you know, one of the ones he listed was this one. It's a stool, or maybe it's a training for party for kids. I don't know. But this counted that as a game, or maybe it's a toy. I don't know, but it counted for him. But another one, a real scholar, counted 81. Another one, a little bit more careful, counted 58. Good. What the heck are they playing? How can you identify some of these things back in here, going back there? Like this one, I'll talk about it later on. Uh, one of the three in, of those scholars called it Mermel Spiel, which is the German for marble games. Mermel is marble. And that's not marble. The thing in his hands is the size of a softball. Another one described it as Skittles, which is like bowling. You knock down the things. And that's not it. But one of them nailed it. One woman, Jeanette Hills, from uh, uh, speak, writing in the Dutch language, described it perfectly, including the penalty that must be paid. So I'm glad to see that. That in the Greek Now, the, the one you see in the background, we call it, in, we played it on the school grounds and in the country. In the country, we call it pique partout, which is French for sting everywhere. Kind of fights everywhere. Uh, in town, we call it roly poly. And roly poly is the typical word usually used in the English language. Uh, Brian Sutton Smith said that was the main word used in places like Australia, uh, New Zealand, South Africa. But there are many names for it. There are many names for it. But, uh, we call it Big Part Two. And on the school ground, we played in English. So it, it was, it was uh, roly poly. It's not a team game. Not a team game. It's every man for himself. This could be me right here, except for the clothes. And secondly, the holes are too far apart. We always had our <coughs> holes much closer together. <coughs> Maybe because they're using a much bigger ball. We usually use a tennis ball. Um, the holes have to be further apart. I don't know, but it's obviously roly poly or big part too. But the Janet Hill described it as veggie ball. Uh, and and that, that's correct. It was not a team game. It's every man for himself. And uh, she says the name for it are multitudinous. In German-speaking lands, it used to call whole ball, a little whole ball. Usually roll ball in England, roly poly. Uh, but if you, if you Google roly poly, you'll find literally hundreds of games, and none of them are this. Uh, until you dig deep, and you might find the article that I wrote. You, know. you just don't, don't find it. Uh, the other one you do find. But in this, this game, little boys are playing. We played this when we were about 8, 9, 10, 11. Got beyond that, we didn't play it too much. And I said it was younger boys, and I'll come back to that at the very end. Uh, I was happy to see an anthropologist picked up on my study. The, the other game that we played is this. In the country, we call this schwal, this is horse. It, I found it described in France, there are several names in France, but one was Schwal Fondue, 
How did the fond do means? The shval fond do in French. Uh, we call it on the school ground, we call it a horse. But uh, we play it several different differently from this. You see, this guy's got his back to a, something pretty solid. Throughout the English language, English world, you, it was, seems to always have someone with a back to a wall. We didn't play it that way. Here, young boys would run up and kind of leapfrog and kind of come down hard and um, try to get the, the boys underneath to collapse. If they collapsed, they had start over again and the boys who collapsed were down on the bottom again. Uh, how, there's two ways this game can end. And we're not sure what this is. One way is uh, how many horns stand? How many? Uh, it's uh, how many horns is buck buck stevas buck buck stand firm? Or how will horns stand on the rock? How many horns in Dutch? How many horns are standing up? And one boy holds up his hand with some fingers, and then. The boys underneath, one of them has to say, one finger. And this person is supposed to look up there and say, wrong. So then he goes up, three fingers. What, how many fingers are holding her up? You know, and he says, oh, two. Oh, you're still down there. And the game ends when he guesses it. That's how that, we didn't do it that way at all. And we didn't play it this way, the high leap. And we never called it Buck Buck. But that Buck Buck was a common name in, the, in English literature. Very common name. Uh, in New Zealand, New England, Opie and Opie. Opie and Opie, that I mentioned here, found 63 names for the game played in the British Isles in the, in the late 60s, and a 62 game that they used to play, used to use to define that game. So over 120 names for the game in the British Isles. And it, children don't have to follow the rules. So we would we'd change rules once in a while. The most popular name you Google this is Johnny on the Pony, or uh, another one is High Cockalora, another name that's commonly used. And those are the two main ones, Johnny on the Pony and High Cockalora. Um, what we call a small farm doing in the country and parts in the city. In our game, we play it differently. In our game, you would line up with your head between the other person's legs. And then the boys would get back to a certain distance and start running and then kind of flip and go buttocks to buttocks and try to drive that guy into the ground. And by that, the whole team collapses. And they lose and they've got to get up and be the caterpillar again. We pound it again. So we pile on. We, we, depending on how, we change the rules once a while. We say, you, once you land, you can't move forward. Other times we say, once you land, you can squirm forward. Usually the game ended when one boy jumping up here lands and one of his foot would touch the ground. Or his hand, or he cuts the fall and you kind of grab it on and the foot touches the ground. Or his hand. If that happens, the whole team loses. And they got to beat down here. This person, we call him the tech, the head. He was usually the biggest, heaviest boy because sometimes you hit hard enough, this guy go flying backwards and the whole team just collapses. Um, in England, it was you. This guy was usually called a pillow. The pillow. And I'll show you why they wrong. Because it had a up against a wall. They can't be forced back. And someone's got a head right in the in the, in the pillow of this person. Uh, so that's how we played the game. <clears throat> in our game, no quarter was asked and none was given. It was a tough game. A lot of people were hurt. I never had any broken game when we were playing, but you're playing on concrete, there's a good chance to hurt some people pretty bad. And some writers claim the game was played by in ancient Rome, and painting in Thebes show it as being painted on the walls in Thebes. It's been identified as existing in Egypt, uh, Turkey, Russia, Italy, India, and Japan. It was apparently widespread throughout this, this continent of Europe and Asia, Eurasia. Why, again, it, it's a pretty common thing. Let's line up and pile on somebody. Uh, but it was a widespread game. Opie and Opie, in the book, described it as the toughest of the games, the one in which players are most frequently hurt, 
and which requires the greatest stamina, esprit de corps, and indeed fortitude. Now in the first game, a little boy can play, and if he's willing to take the punishment, that, that's fair. He can play. In this one, we wouldn't let little boys play. Because you jump on, you find the weakest link, and you go for the weakest link. They collapse, and then you just, little boys were not allowed to play with the big boys. It was a, a tough game. Um, in Freud's painting, you can see it's different than how, from the way we did it. It's, they got it back to a, you can't force it down the way we had done it. Uh, today, games are largely, these games are largely dead in America today. Um, they're rough, unsupervised games, and boys can be hurt, so parents and school officials outlaw it. There are many books on games, and the last time I could find a book, my wife has a master's degree in child development and has a whole bunch of books on games. And in her books, I found one of them. The latest one was 19, 1950s. Recommended this game on school grounds. But since then, no, not being done. There's great emphasis today on safety, on uh, people taking down monkey bars. I've got some examples of that. But a kid can fall off a monkey bar. And usually they put sawdust underneath, but suppose there's a two-year-old child and eight-year-old well, hits it. Uh, so there's a real emphasis on safety. Uh, an article here in time that uh, dodgeball is being abandoned. Somebody might get hurt. Someone's feelings going to get hurt. Someone can't dodge too well, so stays in the middle. That's not fair. And putting an end to monkey bars. Uh, tag. Tag has been outlawed on many school grounds because uh, someone might get hurt, might scrape their knees when they're running. Or someone might tag someone too hard, start a fight. Uh, and the article said that they allowed uh, shadow tag. I tag your shadow. Yeah, you did. Uh, in my play group, that wouldn't go. You didn't tag my shadow. Uh, that, that's kind of tough. But that changes values. You can see the change in these values. Uh, there's still some rough games being played today, like, uh, but they're, they're usually sport, sports that are organized, institutionalized, with adults supervising, like football and baseball. And in football, also, you want the biggest and the baddest and the meanest up there playing, because they're the ones who will, will win the game. In high school, you want the big boys. A little squirt, they're going to get run over, they might get hurt, doesn't play. So there are still some of these rough games being played. But today, the emphasis is on cooperation. Uh, these rough games are being all abandoned. Cooperation and teamwork are encouraged. Brian Sutton Smith, I said, the real author of many of these things, in History of Play in New Zealand, 1840-1950, in 1981 book says, given the often barbaric quality of much 19th century play, this cannot be viewed as an entirely unfortunate development, that these games are banned. Uh, some older people kind of look back and wish. Uh, but you know, this was the Middle Ages, Dark Ages. It was a time of chivalry. It was also a time of brutality, early death, no quarter given, none asked. It was rough. And, you, and we, these games identified who was strong, who had grit, who you could depend upon in warfare, in life in general. Who, who was strong? Who could I depend upon? Might made right. And uh, this is just how it worked in the Middle Ages. And pomp and ceremony and all that, and chivalry. It was also a tough time. The purpose of horse was not necessarily to which team was best. Because in this game, when we played it, teams changed every play period on school ground or out in the country. Uh, pick a team. And so it's written out that to find, identify the best team, but identify the best players, the ones you could rely on, the ones you want on your team. That's what that was all about. Uh, who could be relied upon? A test to identify the, the reliability, strength, grit, and the like of these players. Meanwhile, the game of roly poly, this one back in here, a big part two, uh, was based upon small boys could play, but they had to be willing to accept the punishment. In that game, the way you played it, you had oh, it backed up. In that game, you, this fellow rolls the ball down a string of holes. 
and it gets into your hole. Now, that's me with the reddish hat here. That's my hole. If it gets in my hole, I rush and I grab it, and I throw it at the nearest person I can hit with a ball. If I hit that person, as I hit this guy, I'll put a stick in his hole. Once you have a predetermined number of sticks, usually little twigs, uh, in some places they use little stones, they're no stones where I was raised. Now, look, these little sticks we put, once you had a predetermined three or five, that person lost. Game starts over. But the person lost has to pay punishment. And the, the punishment that we had was that you had to get up against a barn, or there's one good place at school we could use, and put your buttocks in the air, and those got back at a predetermined distance and throw the ball as hard as they could at you. If their hair is sticking up. And you could hear this balls hitting right next to what? They, they threw so hard they often missed. But you could hear that thing hitting the wall, that barn of uh, my, my, my maternal grandmother's house, it was a garage we used. You could hear it hit that whum, hit the garage. And if it hit you and you okay, fine. If you went crying to mother, you never played again. We want boys with grit who would accept the punishment and get in there and play again. And they will accept it. Even if they lost, they could gain stature by having this determination to stick it out, to hang in there. So roly-poly was really designed, maybe to hurt people a little bit. Other, other games, uh, Pedgy Ball, this woman I mentioned from Hills, who identified it correctly, she had boys put their hands up against the wall, and others threw balls at her. Another one described it, and the, the punishment was you had to run through a gauntlet. So the boys would take off their belts, or they'd get a stick, and on two lines, they'd, they'd run through it, they'd pitch as hard as they could as you ran through the line. And once it, you got through the line, maybe twice, however determined ahead of time, the game started over. Decide who, who, who could take it and accept the pain and the punishment in order to play. So it was not, it's not one where you, it, it, designed to put punish boy, but also to find out who, who had determination and grit. Uh, that made things good, uh, as, as we saw it. Uh, even, with, even if it was to lose, and it had to go up against the barn several times, that's fine, if you accept it. And, and we played the game a lot, a lot. Very different from a proof play today, throwing at someone with their buttocks in the air. Um, but, you know, it was a cruel time. My, I was the oldest of six, and my mother, we get in a fight. Oh, God, go out there and solve your problems. I had a brother two years younger than me, and he had to keep up with an older brother. So he was, he was, he had grit. He had determination, and he could pretty much keep up. Uh, one time he, he played my sister, two years younger than him, marbles. He cleaned her clock, and she went complaining to mother. He took all my marbles. Why didn't take your marbles? We're playing for keeps. Well, that's a good lesson. Don't ever play points for marbles. You know, it, it, that's life. I'm not going to take away from him. He won them fairly. Uh, and he's, he's that way. They were used, we used to play a game when I was a little boy. Uh, it's still commonly played in South Louisiana called Bure. And it turns out some football players play it on airplane trips across the country. It can be a brutal game. It's like poker. But stakes are much higher. And he said, yeah, we were chatting one time at my house, and he said, yeah, I've forgotten that game I mentioned. He said, I've forgotten I'll show you how to play it. All right, I'm going to play it for you. So I showed him how to play. Within three games, he was beating me consistently. He just has that determination. He ended up as vice president of Walmart, responsible for two billion, two hundred fifty million in purchases. Uh, wealthy today. But he had that determination he was going to win. And I think birth order has something to do with that. Younger boys have to really hustle to keep up. Another thing that I could mention, I wrote an article on, on the Cajun Mardi Gras. The Cajun Mardi Gras is very different from the New Orleans, or the Biloxi, or the Baton Rouge Mardi Gras. It's in the country, and you have these groups. They go on crews and make fun of the New Orleans people. They never throw trinkets. That's usually for absolutely for But the person who's in charge of the crews are the meanest, toughest guys in town. They can keep people in, in, in check. And there are some ladies' runs. And the ladies' runs, it's the men running, because the women say, oh, women can't 
take charge of other women and beat them, but these men can. And so it's the toughest <coughs> these guys, as long as they're fair and beat people to a certain, you know, certain style and a certain way, it's acceptable. And you play by the rules. If, so, if the guy starts beating you and you start really, you got on four shirts and so it doesn't hurt, but then you might soak it in the water. And so sometimes they use quirks to beat a horse with. But usually it's burlap sacks that are tightly woven. But when they're soaked in the water, but others will, your friend will jump on top of you. But pretty soon his arm is so tired he gives up. Um, but it, it's the toughest count. And that game of Mardi Gras, it goes back to the Middle Ages, back to the time when um, at the end of winter, everybody's hungry. So they go out in the countryside, they gather food, and then they have a communal dinner. New Orleans Mardi Gras has that too, but it's only for the upper class who are invited. This would be for the more the common people, uh, this Mardi Gras thing. So the Cajun rural Mardi Gras is, is, uh, is one, very similar in some ways to what's going on here. It's a rough and tumble time. And, uh, I'll show you some other pictures here. This is, I took this off the internet. These, I guess this is about 1950s. It's young boys, but you see, they've got their back to a wall. That's usually how it's played. You can't make out how many boys are underneath, because you see these feet down there. Maybe one, two, three, four. But this looks like he's about to collapse and hit the concrete down here uh, with the weight on his back. Uh, here's another one. I suppose that there was four boys, five boys, and one says, I'll be the pillow. But you see, his head is not between the legs. His head is on the side. And that was common. This one you can't tell, but the heads are probably on the side. You probably have to do a, a leapfrog jump to get up here. This is another one. Uh, the girl is the pillow. You see, the heads are on the, This one's doing it all wrong, just standing there. Uh, but they're piling on. Uh, none of them have their feet, they're much higher, so it's difficult for the, in our game, our feet often reach the ground, and then you, the whole team lost. And then you've got some, uh, memorializing this, this statue in London, this little uh, guy with a back to a telephone post, and he's lined up here, and so he's the pillow. But see, they do have the head between the legs here. That's how we play it. Any, any questions? I'm going to end right there. Just think of the Middle Ages as a rough time.